and we can talk about the Socratic method um, in and out in relation to this, but so my, my question is, um, just to summarize, uh, after we deconstruct and examine our beliefs, um, do we need to replace it with uh, something, I guess you could call it more, more positive? Should we replace that belief with a new belief or should we, should we not force any kind of replacement? Should we, should we kind of just sit back and play this, play this idea that we shouldn't make assumptions or judgments in the first place? Yeah, so I think the um, uh, Socratic me method uh, is yeah more being uh, uh, like using uh, the irony and the questions um, to uh, tear down uh, your facade and show your true beliefs. Um, so I understand it's. Uh, Standard, uh, say you're saying that it's a bit more of a negative uh, method, um, and uh, I think the Stoics have way more defined values to guide people compared to a uh, Socrates that just wanted um, to show the nakedness of uh, the clergy and uh, the experts. Um, and the such. Um, so I think the Stoics have something to fill this, this void. Um, but I don't know if it's the um, right filler for for it. Um, what do you think? What did you say? The right, the right, what? Right, for... uh, like filler for the. Oh, filler. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, for this void. Um, yeah. Hmm. I, mm, Yeah, I think, um, I also think you're right that the Stoics didn't focus on so much of, of filling that void. Um, they they did something very similar to Socrates, you're right. They, they But they didn't critique. I mean, Socrates went out and critiqued everybody he met, but the, the Stoics kind of did that passively. They kind of did that for themselves and they kind of did that with the, if anybody happened to come upon them, they might have started asking these questions and making these inquiries. Um, and, um, but I don't think that they would have thought it, it necessary to, um, to then fill, fill that void, um, fill that void of belief, because I think at least from their perspective, they would have thought that, um, if you kind of forced a replacement belief for that underlying belief, that's also coming from something that may be false, that may be coming from a false perspective of reality. Um, if uh, um, you have a deep hatred or anger towards somebody, and uh, that's because you kind of view them as having, um, uh, maybe you don't like their extravagant, luxurious lifestyle. So you kind of reinterpret your, you can construct that belief as, perhaps you come to the conclusion that um, just because somebody has more material possessions than you doesn't warrant any anger or hate. Maybe because that more material possessions um, had made you thought that there is this big difference between you that there really isn't. And they shouldn't be, they shouldn't have that big difference in material possessions than you. Therefore, you come to the conclusion that um, this belief that um, they uh, of of hatred or anger towards them isn't warranted. Um, and what do you replace that with? Um, I, I don't think that because you're already coming from a perspective of um, 
hating the rich or hating people who have more than you, um, I don't think you'd be, you're already in a position to give yourself a new belief. I think it's too soon. I think immediately after you reflect on an underlying belief or judgment about somebody or an event or something, um, I, I think you're already in a vulnerable position. I think it's not wise. I think a stoic would say it's actually not wise to um, replace that belief with something immediate, at least immediately, because you don't have enough information. And you already took time to deconstruct the other judgment. Um, why are you going to try and force a new judgment on yourself when you don't know if that's correct or not? Um, I think they would play a wait and see game. Um, Hmm. Yeah, so I, I spoke to um, one of my good friends who's a psychologist um, about the Socratic method, which he uses pretty much on a daily basis. And that's exactly his viewpoint, which was they wouldn't try to replace it with anything. They would let, um, let the patient breathe, basically. Um, and that void, as such, would fill itself over the course of time, but with a refreshed perspective um so yeah i don't personally i don't know that much about it um only what we've discussed and what, what i've read um but certainly it, it tends to backfill itself from a psychological perspective um according to my friend anyway. yeah i think um using this method to explore um one's own um idea of reality or you know the basic values um i don't think you can replace but you can try to unearth these these values to find the 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 most basic ideas about uh, the reality um so I don't think if someone has a misconception, um, maybe it's just um, layers that are obstructing uh, his true uh, belief. And with this kind of, um, of digging, you can get to this very core belief. But I don't think it's about um rooting it out and replacing it so it's more how to call it um to find the essence the and the to distill away all the all the rest so yeah not that truth capital letters, but a, a personal truth. Yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, that's very different than what I, what I found Socrates do, at least, at least in the, in the, at least in the plays that Plato would write about him. Um, Plato, uh, Plato would make Socrates always come to a kind of a joint conclusion with the other person. He would always, um, uh, it would always be presented as a dialogue. Um, and the Socratic dialogue would always come to a conclusion um, that is um, like he would, uh, Socrates wouldn't just show the ignorance of the other person. He would turn that around to show the kind of the converse, the, 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 the reverse statement and um, then make that assertion and show that that's the statement, that's the true belief that they have. Um, because obviously if their, if their original belief was self-contradictory, then they need to, um, then they need to believe in this thing because this statement, because this statement is contrary to what you saw, what you, what you had believed before. Um, I think, um, I didn't, I never asked actually, because you kind of started beginning talking about this by discussing the connections between the Socratic method and CBT. But um, I'm, I'm not sure, would anybody like to see like an example that I have written down in a slideshow of like what the Socratic method 
is in dialogue form. This is kind of an original Socratic method, uh, Socratic dialogue from Plato's Republic I pulled from a copy I have. Um, again, it's not perfect, uh, and it's not something we have to dwell on too long because it's not, I don't think it's the uh, kind of application CBT we, we would want, but it is a good example of what Socrates actually meant originally by a Socratic method. Um, so if you, if you just watch your screen, perfect. Okay, so I picked this one out because I thought it was, um, I, I, it was, it's a long passage. Sometimes they take several pages just to come to a conclusion. So you see these uh, ellipses here. Uh, I try to basically take out anything that was extraneous. Um, and I tried to pick out a passage that was at least in part connected to the content of, of Stoicism when we learn about it. In this case, what does wisdom mean? What does ignorance mean? What does justice mean? Um, and he's having a dialogue with this character, Thrasymachus, and he starts out by asking him, um, actually the dialogue started earlier, and they're talking about something else, and then he moves on to the topic of the arts, and Socrates starts asking him about a musician, and Socrates just starts asking him which is wiser and which is more foolish. Um, Thrasymachus says, clearly the musician wise, and he who is not a musician is foolish. And he keeps going on about this. Um, it's actually very logical. Um, the, one, the, one, the one thing that I think the original Socratic method is really good at is understanding how logic is formed, how, what, what logic and philosophy really means. Um, when you ask a question about somebody's prior definition of something, I think is really good for, if, if not the application of it. Um, I also wrote down a, a, an interpretation of it so if um take a minute to read this he then goes on to this passage here um and i think at this point i can switch to the next slide because some of the language is a little bit um old-fashioned at least the translation is this translation is from 19 I may say 1968. So much more new than the um, much newer than the usual 1900 or 1920s translations of the classics we've been reading, um, but still quite old. Um, I think the most interesting part is after this passage when he starts talking about um, wisdom and ignorance. Um, this passage basically means from the because this text is annotated, which I really like. Um, this text is basically Socrates uh, um, understanding that what Thrasymachus is trying to say, so Socrates is just repeating his, um, his, his belief that he had been telling all this time, um, that what Thrasymachus is basically trying to say uh, is that um, uh, a person who is an artist or a musician or something of this sort, um, will uh, would he always um, try and remain in his domain of knowledge? Will he only try and gain knowledge or say he has an authority on a topic in the, in the field that he has that knowledge in? Or will he try to um, uh, gain knowledge in other fields and, and try and... Um, uh, um, try and claim authority in other fields in which he's not typically an authority figure in. Um, and then he goes in this back and forth. Um, and what of the ignorant? Would he not desire to have more than either the knowing or the ignorant? And um, they keep going back and forth about wisdom, goodness, and um, uh, Socrates comes basically drags Thrasymachus into, into a corner. Um, and he basically gets Thrasymachus to conclude that the just has turned out to be wise and good and the unjust evil and ignorant. Um, and I think now that I'm reading this, I should have put something in the beginning that originally Thrasymachus was basically trying to say 
that um, sometimes it is good to be unjust because sometimes you need to, um, uh, sometimes society is unfair and sometimes uh, it's um, difficult to always be just. So sometimes you need to be unjust too. But Socrates tr basically drags him into a corner and, and gets him to affirm this final belief here. And I think I have a good statement here. Um, this is the annotation. So um, this is basically the, 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 the thrust of Socrates' argument. He tries to make the Thrasymachus. Um, he's doing a comparison, basically. So the reason why he uses the whole argument that the artist remains within the limits of his art, he doesn't try and um, take over the, uh, or assume knowledge or understanding of other people's knowledge. Um, is a lot like how the just man would never do something unjust. And if he does, then he's not just, he's unjust. That's basically Socrates' argument is what I'm, is what I'm getting at here. Um, I think this is really the original Socratic method. This is really what Socrates was doing, was basically just going back and forth in this dialogue. And just um, if somebody said... Uh, um, you know, if I made the statement, um, wise people are always good people. Okay, well, then you would have to, you would start dissecting that and saying, okay, what do you mean by wise? What do you mean by good? Um, do you mean by um, good being always kind? Okay, then we have to go into details about the definitions of what kindness means. So this is what Socrates was basically doing. Um, this is very different though in CBT. Like, I, um, and I, I think this is very different than what we are saying here is that um, Socrates comes to this final conclusion um, and gets Thrasymachus, instead of just showing Thrasymachus' ignorance, he tries to turn that argument around and show Thrasymachus that what he actually believes is this. Which I think is interesting. I mean, it's always like if, if you, if through, and I'll, I'll, I'll end it with this. Maybe you guys want to comment on um, what Socrates is saying here and, and what this Socratic method looks like. But um, I think it's not a bad thing if through the course of reflection and reflecting on your judgments that you come to a positive belief, you come to a conclusion you didn't think you had before. You come to a belief that in this case, the wise are, are good and the unjust evil and ignorant. Okay, fine. But like, I think Tony, what you were saying is is really a, a good thing to keep in mind that um, what your um, uh, psychologist friend said that it's um, not good to force that ulterior conclusion or belief um, that you should be believing in um, if it can't come out naturally because it's not something your mind has had taken time to think about yet. And your mind has already been trying to dissect the original belief. Why force it to construct a new belief um, when it's all it's done is deconstructing? Um, I think what I was reading, there was a good article that actually critiques this. There was a good article by somebody who runs a, a stoic website, one of the links I put in the event description. And he says just this, actually, that um, there's a big difference between this, 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 uh, the Socratic method originally, what Socrates did, and what um, uh, the Stoics did, and that Socrates really liked the idea that you can basically know things and, and, and be certain of things through reason and, and, through, through reason and through dialogue and through logic. And the Stoics um, didn't entirely, at least he makes the argument, wouldn't entirely agree with that. He thinks that... Um, the Socratic method is good for dissecting, for deconstructing, and the Stoics would agree with that, but that the Stoics wouldn't assume that reason itself and logic itself are enough to come to knowledge. I think this is a big difference between Socrates and the Stoics. Like Socrates here basically goes through this logical procession of this is what you don't know. These are all these logical contradictions. Here's what you do know. And the Stoics wouldn't entirely agree with that because... Um, uh, logic is also logic can also be a form of judgment like just because you use logical rules um doesn't mean you started out in the right place or doesn't mean um the conclusions you're make you're making 
are also being drawn from false beliefs or judgments. And so I think there's a big distinction between Socrates and um, what the Socrates had intended for this method and the Stoics. Just my observation and something I read from that, um, um, from one of these um, articles I had posted in the event description. What do you guys think? Yeah, so uh, I see, oh, hello, Abdul. So I see a couple of different, um, how to say, uh, uses of the of this method. Because I can imagine somebody using uh, it only as a, a rhetoric uh, method to drive people into a corner and just with um, this this logic, this um, drive them into a corner and make them um, like twist their ideas and words um, to a, like your own truth. Um, and in in the CBT um, method, method, it's more let's find out what's your uh, basic uh, truth and it's completely different like um i think uh, socrates himself used it uh, in sometimes um like sometimes ironic but um you know, exposing somebody as a hypocrite, it's, it wouldn't help this person uh, grow. <laughs> I think um, it would make uh, people want uh, to poison you um, for corrupting the youth or something. <laughs> Wild example. Yeah. Um, I think, yeah, like, you know, Reflection is is a very important uh, tool for uh, growth. I, I would say it's a required uh, tool for growth. But going uh, to people, um, tearing down their clothes uh, and putting a, a mirror and saying, this is you, I don't think uh, <laughs> they would uh, be happy about it. And I don't think it would help them grow as a person. Um, and I'm trying to remember about um, one one dialogue um, with a priest uh, about what's uh, holy and what's uh, unholy. Um, and I think in in the end, uh, this priest uh, got. Um, a crisis uh, of uh, uh, faith or something. <laughs> um, uh, I, I can find it uh, later. Um, so, I, I seem to remember that too. Yeah, there there was a holy unholy uh, section. Yeah. What was his name? Um, Euphrates, maybe. Something. So. Never mind. Never mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, you're going to a priest and shattering uh, the basis of, of uh, his whole life it's not something we seek to uh, to learn and implement in our own uh, uh, own life and our own search for uh, for truth and so yeah, it, it's nice to, to, to learn about it. I think the CBT version, it's way more useful to for our purposes. Yeah, absolutely. That's a good point also that um, it's a good example of uh, the, the hypocrite. Um, uh, I think um, uh, Socrates, as much as he didn't want him to paint himself a um, 
a sophist, somebody who was uh, teaching others. And while he claimed that he wasn't being paid, which is which is true, I, I, I think he was too much of a teacher. I think he actively tried to teach people and which is which is noble to an extent. I mean, you, you don't criticize teachers today for um, uh, mm, uh, earning a living by teaching. But this is, um, I think Socrates went out of his way to um, stick his finger in other people's business and say, yeah, this is, this is something that's wrong that you're thinking because this and this, or he, he wouldn't start out that way, but he'd start questioning them. And um, I think there's also a, um, that's it. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's it. Um, I was also just thinking that there is a, um, uh, where are you guys again? Lost our um, had a thought. No, I'm Um, yeah, I completely forgot what I was going to say. Um, but I think you're right. I think the, the idea that we should, um, do that is counter to stoicism. Um, that I actually, that this is what I wanted to mention that, um, there's also two sides of this because, uh, a CBT, uh, and using the Socratic method in it doesn't just, oh, Tony, I see your hand raised. Um, uh, doesn't just um, help you to interrogate your beliefs. I think stoicism itself, uh, more than just CBT, because I think CBT's using this method is, is really good to interrogate and examine your beliefs and judgments. I think there's also a flip side where um, stoicism, before even using the Socratic method, helps you to also prepare for that. Because, right, I mean, the, the reason why Socrates was hated was because he was, uh, he was basically it felt like by a lot of people that when he asked them questions about their beliefs, he was asking them something very personal. And that to them was like an attack on their identity. And when you're not prepared for something like that, when you see that as an attack and a threat, you're, you're going to naturally want to maybe poison him. Uh, but um, uh, I think stoicism is a good, like it, it, I think it's necessary to kind of like, even before you use the Socratic method, because otherwise you wouldn't be as prepared as you would be in countering these beliefs. Yeah, Tony. Yeah, I'm just interested in the some of the wording that Socrates cho chose to use, um, particularly in the last line. Then. then the just has turned out to be wise, to be wise and good, and the unjust evil and ignorant. Now, my understanding of evil would be in sort of an ecclesiastical sort of pseudo-Christian way, good and evil. But what would that mean in a secular way? When we take out the religious elements of these words, because they're actually quite loaded words when you think of it. Um, so I'm just wondering what he meant by the word evil in particular. I, I can't, and, I, and I'm not an authority on this, so I can't say for sure, but what I read was that... Um, uh, Socrates didn't boil all the virtues down to what the Stoics did when they when they talked about these four virtues, but Socrates basically had a kind of equivalence to goodness and virtue. So my initial interpretation would be that when he says evil, he means unvirtuous. But I, um, but for Socrates, that meant not good. So <laughs> I I don't know if that really helps solve the problem because. Obviously, evil is the opposite of not good. So I'm not really sure what he what he entirely meant by that. Um, Socrates also wasn't a man who wrote down or explained his thinking. He was just a guy who uh, I think he he more or less acted in ways that he wanted other people to follow. Uh, so he never explained what the good was. He just tried to act as an example of what the good should be. So I'm not sure if 
but this is something that we would have to do research on. I have, uh, if somebody else wants to add, try and answer that, that's a really good question. It's a loaded question too. <laughs> um, you're right. It's that these word, these words are loaded. I think what um, Gonzalo said about the word rational a few weeks ago is a lot like this, where when you talk about good and evil, it's like, what, what do you mean by that? There's, um, there's not really a clear definition. Um, and we need that in order to kind of move forward. I'm not really sure. I think ignorant, what's weird is that I think if you're talking about the language, I think the word ignorant is actually a lot more clear because obviously I think ignorant for him was somebody who has never reflected on this before, somebody who never reflected on his beliefs. So I think ignorant is pretty clear, um, but wise and good are something Socrates usually puts together. So I'm not even sure what Socrates would have necessarily said is the difference between wise and good. Um, this may be something that is mm. somebody who knows a bit more about ancient Greek would have to answer for us. I don't know. I what do you think? Really, I can't really find a clear Socratic definition of good and evil. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think... Uh, so, about the... Uh, 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 virtue and and, uh, and such I think he, he saw uh, knowledge as as good truth as good um, but yeah it's kind of hard to to find I mean, this, the, there seems to be a certain element of subjectivity to all of this really which is quite interesting you know, it's not too prescriptive It'd be interesting to see what um, the word evil meant in his uh, contemporary context. Hmm. Because we're talking before Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And like a good time before, I think the dates I saw were uh, fifth century BCE. I think it's good, like half a millennium before Christ. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's yeah. I don't know. Uh, Abdul. Uh, Hello, folks. Yes, yeah, sorry for joining late. I had a fire commitment so, uh, that led to delay my attendance. But yeah, um, I just wanted to say, um, uh, isn't it the case maybe um, um, basing definition based on the religion before Christian Christianity, maybe Judaism or um, Yeah, I think it has to do with it. I mean, maybe, not certain too, but maybe uh, as a direction to go through. I mean, I don't know uh, how, um, I mean, how far between Socrates and Judaism, uh, yeah, um, but yeah, that's my uh, assumption, I would say. I would call it an assumption. Uh, Tony? Yeah, I, I mean, obviously I don't know that much about this, but um, which you can probably tell. Um, but I would assume that Socrates wouldn't subscribe to the Judaistic notion of, of evil, which I would assume is any anyone who is against the tenets of Jehovah. Um, or the tenets of the Torah, the, the Old Testament. I wouldn't assume that it was something along, along that line. Um, so yeah, I, I don't really, I can't really contribute to anything, but it's, it's still a mystery to me. So I may have, uh, oh, sorry, Shikam, I just saw you. Um, did you want to say something? Um. Yeah, um, just that, uh, yeah, no way that uh, he would have just accepted tenets from some uh, some deity without, uh, like, <laughs> asking and dissecting um, every every aspect every aspect uh, of them. And the other, uh, um, 
the other thing I wanted there to say is that good and evil as in absolute terms are I'm, I think they're very like Abrahamic in, uh, in nature wrongdoing um, uh, being uh, let's say uh, immor being immoral uh, being um, excessively self um, uh, like centered and uh, acting only for your own self interest these are things that would I don't know fall into the category of, of evil uh, but like yeah, now, now I'm looking at the, the what Steve uh, sent. Uh, so, Steve, go ahead. Um, yeah, this is a really good post by somebody who maybe has a, a bit more authority on what ancient Greek is. There's actually a good paragraph on, for example, the difference in ancient Greek between the word good and beauty. Uh, for example, the word in ancient Greek for good is kalos with one L, and the word for beauty is kalos with two Ls. And apparently in, in, in ancient Greek, that the, the word kalos for beauty, the two Ls, basically just means a nice form, a good form, order, symmetry. And so there was a, um, a goodness to, it sounds like goodness to the Greeks might have been a, a bit of a concept like beautiful or ordered. And what he's also saying is that... Um, uh, He says, so evil in Plato is defined as the luck of Kalon. Uh, I don't know what that, what is Kalon? He used that word before in here. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. What 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 he's saying is actually actually what we were <laughs> actually what we were saying before is that um, uh, it's no no coincidence that Socrates basically puts good and evil defined in terms of each other or as opposites because this is exactly what this post is saying that he basically says that the Greeks did think of it like that the Greeks really didn't have a separate definition for them. They they considered the words good and evil for them, which is which are um, kalon and kakon, which sound almost identical except for the l and the k. They're basically the opposite, and they're supposed to mean that. So they're only they're only thought of in terms of each other. Um, there is he talks about a little bit about like a, a way in which the Greeks thought of goodness as beauty or as order. And so evil might be the opposite as kind of disorder or disarray or unbeautiful. So there might be there might be something to that, which I I can only say as in passing on this on the surface level that I, I do I do I do know that often enough Greeks did really like to talk about the concept of beauty. It was something that they talked about a lot. But as apart from that, I I don't know. But this this does shed some light. At least this does answer the question. I mean, they did kind of self these words were kind of self reference referential they just referenced each other and they weren't they didn't really have any kind of ulterior definition um so i think i think the greeks were to um uh they had a, a really good start in questioning these concepts but i don't think they really dissected them or interpreted them to a very very deep extent it sounds like from this at least if this person is correct this is um the, the Greeks had a very more or less simple, intuitive understanding of, of good and evil. Which is why, which is why, I mean, I would at least for me personally, and I don't know what, what this, this works for you, but I would, I would defer the concept of goodness and evil to virtue and unvirtue, at least in terms of stoicism. Whenever somebody, if somebody ever said acted to act, to act, to act good philosophically, at least in the classical tradition, I would always equate with virtue. And then I would always think of the stoic virtues. That at least would help me anchor myself if I'm not really familiar with what these words mean. 
I'm not sure that's what the Greeks mean. That's what I'm saying. I'm not sure that's what the Greeks would mean, but that's what I would, how I would try and um, reconcile these words. Yeah, I mean, somebody had to start uh, this concept of uh, ethics and they uh, they were pretty much at the start. So not having a, a clear definition of stuff yet, I think it's uh, <laughs> understandable. It took, took a while uh, to, to reach uh, conclusions and definitions. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm going to take this uh, screen away because I don't think it's um, all I had were uh, this and um, a few uh, light frogging, um, which we could interrogate ourselves about. I think um, we could do more to understand this part. I think we should start t discussing more rather than the simple philosophy underlying Socrates and Plato. I think it would be more interesting if we, from for the rest of the um, meetup, discuss more about how is the Socratic method uh, as part of a CBT, as part of a cognitive behavioral therapy, can help us really challenge our underlying judge judgments. Um, and then I thought about perhaps actually practicing one um, uh, in the second hour. Um, I had put this question on here too, actually, um, because actually this, this brings me back. This was just, I, I, I don't think we have to discuss this any further because I think we actually answered this question already. Um, because I, this was, that's actually connects to the question about, um, should we replace the underlying belief that we critically examine with something new? Um, because the, um, uh, uh and I, th I thought that might be um, something anti-Stoic, something that the Socratic method originally did. Um, so this, I think, is a moot point because I think we've already answered this sufficiently. I don't think the Stoics would have, or today would like to replace it with any kind of new belief or judgment. Um, but I think in practice, and then I think actually perhaps modeling one here in the session would, would be really useful um having a socratic dialogue not how socrates did it but perhaps examining maybe a, a simple statement um that we might ordinarily agree with but that we might want to reflect further on might be worth doing just to kind of get in the habit of what it means to really critically examine a judgment so before I move on to that part, though, I think before we move on to something like this, I think I would just like to ask anybody if anybody has anything further to say about how we could use the Socratic method practically. I mean, um, uh, journaling wise, this is something we could use just um, written down, actually. Uh, it's nothing that we can just, uh, we, we, we just have to ponder. Um, it's something that I think is also really useful and actually um, uh, uh, practice through traditional stoic methods. Like I'll give you a good example. Um, and I'm going to take my screen away because, um, I don't think there's anything more really that I, I have to share on the slideshow. Um, uh, there was a, um, th my, in my journal, in my practical journal, um, which I keep almost daily, I'm almost perfect at it. So almost daily. Um, and this is something I came back to recently, but I had actually focused on this very early on and I wanted to re-reflect on it. Um, and um, I had asked myself very similar questions, um, but I was asking myself, um, for example, for most of my life, I realized that I've been a bit more, a bit, uh, what's the word, uh, aggressive? No, like I had a little bit of avarice, uh, in the sense of um, um, trying to attain um, knowledge. I think a lot of people who, um, I think 
early on and earlier on in my life, I thought that I had to um, uh, be as smart as I can be, be as uh, knowledgeable as I can be. Um, and I think earlier on in my life, I, I this this idea was kind of deep set um, uh, in my identity as I was um, re-examining why I thought, because this is not something I had known consciously. This is something that I had thought I had to um, examine over and over again in order to finally get at the fact that I truly believe that I need to kind of, as I put it in my journal, this is something very, very personal for me, something I need to be kind of the smartest guy in the room. And I realized that um, uh, as I was questioning why that is, um, I came to that conclusion because I had started realizing that um, I just would make excuses not going out with friends or not doing things that would ordinarily be part of a good and good social life by just making the excuse that I need to study or I need to do to do research. Um, and I ended up realizing that this was basically from a, um, uh, an, this came about because of an early childhood experience for a few years. Um, I had a really, really close childhood friend, which I, I don't regret making. Um, he was a really close friend in um, maybe middle school, early high school. And um, uh, as much as he was a good friend and he was always there for me, he was also a little bit of an, an asshole. And he was very, very much so a um, um, somebody who could... Um... Hi, Dan. It's good to see you. Good to see you all. Um, actually, just to just to interject, um, uh, Dan, I didn't, I, I, I hope um, because you guys had daylight savings already, right? Um, yeah, we right. we didn't, so um, uh, we have it in about a week. So it's five o'clock here. I didn't know if you realize. Okay. Um, it's good you made it because I was worried that um, actually people overseas might not get that because we have there's this period of a period of March where we're only five hours ahead of you, not six hours. Um, and anyway, um, I'm I'm just recounting an experience of mine, and I, I started realizing that this friend would constantly kind of show off um, what he what he knew or what he could do, um, and um, I realized after kind of reliving some of those experiences with my friend earlier on um, that this was perhaps, and I, I really put a, a big maybe there in my my journal, but I said perhaps this is the kind of a, a not a reason why I believe it, but a cause of why I might have believed it, um, and this helped me to all of a sudden sort of just kind of remove that philosophy from my identity. Um, not that knowledge was bad, but that this kind of avarice was um, to a large extent unhealthy. Um, and I think that that, because um, it was a kind of an overcompensation, I think what I realized, and this is more psychoanalytical than um, uh, Socratic, but after that part of a Socratic method of kind of examining, um, why do I believe this? Because um, I came to this conclusion because asking myself, why do I believe knowledge is good? Why do I believe I have to constantly be searching for it? And I I boiled that down, but then afterwards I kind of moved into a, a kind of psychoanalytical part of my reflection where I basically um, dealt with the fact that um, uh, this is something I don't need to, I don't need to believe in. This is something that's unhealthy. This is something that's, um, that while knowledge is good, um, this kind of aggression that I, I put into it um, is a compensation for what uh, I guess he had been unconsciously um, doing to me. And so, um, I will rarely share personal things about that, but this is something of a very personal belief and a very personal um, psychoanalysis that I, I, I really put into my journal. And I think doing this on a regular basis, in, instituting the Socratic method of making maybe making a statement that you initially believe in and then critically examining that and whether or not, and you could come up with nothing. You could come up with the fact that actually there's nothing wrong with this belief, but I think um, using that method could 
perhaps lead to further insights into why you maybe believe that or whether you think it's healthy to believe that or not. Um, this is something I find really, really useful. If I write it down, it really helps. Um, Thanks for sharing that, Steve. Really interesting. Um, it's it's interesting for me just to try to understand what the end game um, for the Socratic method is. Um, we've discussed that there's no sort of um, prescriptive conclusion that you're trying to get to when you use the Socratic method. Um, so why use it? It, it, it puzzles me slightly because um, we're not trying to come to a logical conclusion at the end of it. It seems highly subjective. Um, so when you start using the Socratic method, really, what is the logic behind it? Yes, I can. Um, if you uh, use this method uh, to get somewhere, it means you know the answer already and you don't you don't need this method um, and trying to to understand i think um what led you to to these assumptions to these uh, conclusions uh, it's a helpful uh, thing to know about about yourself about the world um and I know, like personally, um, I have a lot of uh, like first feelings or first assumptions that are just more like reactions. And um, and I think uh, some kind of a reflection is needed in order to to understand where are these assumptions coming from um, why am i feeling this way about this uh, situation if you have perfect knowledge of uh, your inner workings and everybody else's uh, inner workings yeah of course you don't need <laughs> you don't need a reflection you don't need to think about it you just know um but my, my personal experience is that some dig digging uh, needs to be done. I think it's um yeah yeah I think it's it's just it's it's a useful method and I was um I forget Tony if you if you came right before or right after I had started to talking to Shikam and Avil about it but um I realized this was actually a really good uh, topic to discuss after the passions because after meditating a little bit on the Socratic method, this is basically a good method to use for examining those passions. Um, when in CBT, um, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm still really happy that Shakam had introduced me to that podcast, this the Stoic Psychologist podcast. If, so if you haven't started listening to it, it is really, really interesting. And the, I think the second episode, he has a big interview with Donald Robertson. And Donald Robertson basically says there's two kind of schools of thought in CBT and cognitive behavior therapy, the kind of acceptance where you, once you find out your underlying belief or judgment, you accept it. And um, you don't find, you, you try not to stress yourself out over it anymore. But then there's another school of thought that says what's actually more helpful is if you challenge those beliefs, you um, disagree with them um, because they're unhealthy. So you need to kind of purge them from yourself, you extirpate or remove these passions. Um, I think that's what the Socratic method is really helpful for, is um, removing and challenging those underlying beliefs or the passions with the, with the Stoics thought of them. Um, so if you have a judgment about an event that's external to you that you can't control, or if you have an, a strong emotion like, like anger or hate or fear or disgust that's kind of um contrary to um uh contrary to to nature basically contrary to what um you really need to be feeling you don't need to be under threat you don't need to feel this um then the socratic method can help you kind of 
logically under, come to the conclusion that it really is unhealthy, that it really is something that you shouldn't be, that it, um, uh, that it really be a, shouldn't be a judgment or belief that you hold. And whether you think that's because it's, um, uh, it's, it's wrong or unhealthy or if it's right, but it's, um, it's nothing to stress yourself out over because um, uh, you shouldn't worry about what that person thinks or does is up to you and how you conclude and reflect on it. But I think the Socratic method starts helping you think about that judgment in the first place. Um, Dan. Yeah, to add to that, um, besides uh, uh, fixing your passions, um, I think uh, another thing we battle with is long-term bias. Sometimes we're for or against something, or we have a belief that things work a certain way. And this Socratic method, uh, if we're genuinely asking questions to learn new things, not just, um, I think I think someone mentioned earlier that you could be, uh, you could be, quote, know where you're going and um, in, the, in this questioning. But if you're truly genuine in your desire to learn new things, you could realize, wow, I have a bias for something. And then you could overturn that. Hmm. Yeah, Dan, you can go ahead again. Oh, you turn. You... Yeah, I, I didn't know it's it's turn it's turning on my hand automatically. <laughs> yeah, I think it um, I think it turns off automatically when you start speaking. It's a weird, interesting uh, function. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know, Tony. Um, maybe you should you should tell us if that's an adequate answer because I'm actually curious to see if um you still do see value in it or if you have kind of uh, if you have a. a what you think is perhaps a, be a better strategy to kind of look at your passions or strategies, because I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm honestly asking because the Socratic method is a really particular, really philosophical way of doing this. And it's not necessarily for everybody, right? I mean, this is why CBT gives all these different strategies in order to examine their beliefs. So I'm quite interested, are these, are these is this information helpful? Like is, is the Socratic method something you might use? No. Um, in, in a word, um, I think it's interesting, um, but my mind, the way my mind works is reasonably logical. So, um, although the Socratic method is, is logical, the conclusions seem to be somewhat subjective to me. Um, so I'd like to use something which is slightly more prescriptive if, if there is anything, but, um, I mean, I do question my own beliefs on a consistent basis, really. Um, you know, ever since I, I found stoicism, it's, it's been an active part of what I do. Um, in particular, with regards to virtues, you know, just self-control, um, really just trying to be, trying to do the right thing in, in, in the right way. Um, so, I, yeah, I mean, will I sit down and dissect the Socratic method and apply it to my life? Probably not. Um, I, I like CBT more because it seems to be more prescriptive to me. Yeah, Abdul. Thanks, yeah. I think um, perhaps the issue is um, um, the Socratic method is same as um, the stoic uh, principles it's it's quite broad and uh, um, when it comes to uh, application you do uh, tend to um, apply it depending on your lifestyle you don't need to change your lifestyle um, to apply maybe the Socratic method or um, stoic principles because they are tools to help you understand yourself and to to approach things in a stoic way or philosophical way. Um, I do agree that if if someone is is looking to um, pursue something prescriptive um, and 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 like sequential. CBT will be the the main option, especially if uh, 
what can I say? If if the individual is new to a particular philosophy, for example, if I, I think I came across this point in in one of the meetings before, uh, but yeah, it, it's maybe not into it. it, it I mean, philosophy generally, mainly Stoicism, and I, I don't know about Socrates' philosophy, but uh, I assume maybe it has the same theme. But um, for those who who, who are seeking uh, detailed guidance, it may not be the best option. Uh, but for me, I, I as I said, I really enjoy the broadness because um, I can have my own meanings and pursue them but with a stoic approach uh, I, I feel i feel i mean from my uh, limited exploration so far i'm, I'm just new to uh, stoicism but i do feel that um it can be like um, building blocks like you build the blocks based on them you build your uh, meanings based on them so then when you construct your structure the building blocks are really solid so that your structure doesn't fade or fall apart where if you pursuing your own meanings or in your own ways the chances that you have your structures falling apart due to lack of strength of your building blocks the chances are higher i feel when you because, because, yeah, there are people who approach the level of understanding of life uh, uh, that we haven't. Uh, but, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Otherwise, I'll keep going. It's okay. I mean, however much you need to speak, you can you can speak. So, um, uh, Shakam. Yeah, uh, I'll... I'll just post uh, this uh, quote uh, at the start of every uh, meetup because uh, <laughs> I feel it uh, it fits uh, every time. Um, uh, so it's a uh, only answer for, uh, for Tony, but also continuing uh, what Abdul uh, is saying. So I think it's uh, it's very important to. Um, not every step, not, that's, that would be a bit too much, but just a self-examination um, to see if there's something uh, that's um, uh, burdening you, uh, slowing you down, maybe something is uh, unhealthy. Without, uh, without this self-examination, only when uh, you face like real problems, you'll recognize uh, you'll recognize uh, this uh, this problem, this um, um, how to say, yeah, biases or uh, unhealthy uh, thought uh, patterns, unhealthy ways to um, um, uh, to cope with the uh, feelings and. By examining your own ruling uh, faculty and uh, looking at uh, uh, other people and the universe, then you can then you can understand uh, and orient yourself like where you stand. Um, so yeah, and what Abdullah said. Um, you don't have to invent all your uh, building blocks. Some people uh, found uh, and chiseled uh, some bricks. You can use those. Um, I think after after uh, meditating on this quite briefly, but uh, still nonetheless, that I think I think a big gap is. Um, between why we may not necessarily want to use the Socratic method is not because we don't want to examine our beliefs. Um, but I think the Socratic method has a kind of a brand of how you do that. And I think the brand is doing it by, by very strict logical reasoning. And I think 
I think the I think in Stoicism you don't necessarily need to do that. I think the the method of in, in which you employ uh, CBT and we have already tons of methods. Um, um, kind of you could examine a um, you you could examine your beliefs by understanding the ideal Stoic or the ideal sage and understand whether or not they would do this in this situation. So you have all these other techniques or examining whether or not this is out of your control. And then you can examine whether or not your belief is justified. So I think the fact that, I think the Socratic method has like a specific kind of brand. And you can tell me if I'm wrong, tell me if this is maybe not the reason why this turns you off, but actually this makes a lot of Stoic sense because uh, Stoicism doesn't really like to employ a lot of strict logical reasoning like Aristotle, Plato and Socrates did. They like to um, uh, they like to appeal to your inner nature, um, and this is not necessarily what this is definitely not what Socrates does. Socrates employs a lot more complex method, which for him works, and for me, I, I, I do like um, I do like doing this for myself. But you're right; I don't think it's necessarily stoic. I think it's maybe an add-on that um, I hear some CBT specialists do, but it's not necessarily. A strictly stoic principle and i think that's why maybe stoics might be put off by it because it's not in accordance with nature it's it's add on, it's added on to that reason is never natural so to speak it's something that you kind of employ systematically um and something you you control which is not necessarily always within your grasp what the stoics would say and so uh, uh dan yeah, to follow what you said about uh, the Socratic method, questioning how you're handling something, I would say that um, uh, something that might surprise you is that a Stoic using that method might say, wait a minute, I don't know what Marcus Aurelius or Epictetus said to help me in this situation, whatever this situation might be. So I might switch to Buddhism or Taoism. Hey, there's a quote I remember over there. There's a mantra where they said something which uh, can help me. It, uh, in a funny way, it kind of remem- reminds me that uh, over the years, sometimes I saw, uh, what do you call those, um, action movies where the protagonist switches from kung fu to jujitsu because that's how he has to solve this problem in front of him. And uh, he's, <laughs> he's switching systems, but he's getting through it, you know? That's, that's uh, what a stoic might have to do. And that's, that's why I enjoy learning from the American transcendentalists and Taoists, because they have certain wisdom that we can compare to Stoicism, but they express it a different way. So that's why I enjoy it. Uh, Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um, Yeah, I just wanted to say, just realize maybe, maybe, um, the expression of building blocks is not the best way of putting it together. Um, um, what I really meant is stoicism and um, generally gives gives me the it's a tool to probe and probe and test um, what gets on your way uh, uh, and and what I really like about it is the freedom that you have uh, in each principle. It's it doesn't restrict you towards particular way of thinking, and that's what I enjoy because when I think, I don't like to have tools that limitates my thinking, and but rather guide and and direct um, me towards better determination and, and better level of awareness um so yeah yeah I, I take i take back the building block thing because i don't think it does make good sense uh but, but what what maybe puts it in, in better words would be that a freedom of the or the broad um the broadness of the tool I enjoy the broadness, but I, I understand that uh, even myself in some situation, if I'm not familiar with the tool, I would not go and explore a, a broad tool. I'd rather pursue something more detailed because I just need it for this specific situation that I'm in. For example, if someone 
having a depression. He will not pursue an stoic philosophy if he is not familiar with it, and rather will go with CBT or psychology advice. Hmm. Yes, I come. Uh, continuing um, uh, what uh, um, you Steve uh, said and um, and then um, I think stoicism um, can give us a a way to think about uh, tools uh, it gives some tools but uh, I think it recognizes that you can't have uh, all the tools from the start so if uh, there's something useful from other uh, philosophies, use it uh, to reach closer uh, to a virtuous life. Because if that's the goal, uh, use the tools uh, you can get. And the Socratic method is just another tool. And I don't think every health problem needs um, a, an operation with incisions and stuff. So not every reflection has to use uh, the Socratic method. But if you need a scalpel to really, you know, <laughs> dig deep uh, and examine it from uh, all directions, then yeah, it's a good tool. I won't use it uh, for a very simple, very mundane uh, stuff, but um, I think um, for deep issues like biases, um, I think uh, it's a useful tool. Yeah, it's a really, um, uh, Dan, I, I'm, I'm just, bouncing off here maybe have an um, interjecting voice that um, I really liked what you said by the way Dan that was a really good f uh, follow-up to what I said actually really made it clear what we were what we should be really thinking is that um, uh, that these philosophies are really tools and guidebooks and we use them to our advantage when the best occasion arises to use them um, and it's a really really poignant point to make because um, we can't limit ourselves, just like how CBT, modern CBT has expanded on this kind of list of tools and options for us to use beyond even what the early Stoics had done. Um, we have to do the same thing about um, more broadly um, other philosophies as well. I really like how you talked about the transcendentalists and, and Taoists. Um, more familiar with the Taoists. I don't really know about the transcendentalists, um, but um, that's a really good point. And then Shakam, what you said that, um, uh, that it really is like a Socratic method is like a surgeon's tool. It's like something that's really serious. And you're right. I think I think actually what you now what I wanted to point out is the last thing you said is that if you want to examine your biases. So I think typically day to day judgments and beliefs, yeah, you know, these, these strong passions we have about external events or other people are not necessarily the worst things that happen to us, right? They're not. They're not biases. They're not. Um, uh, they're not. Um, uh, I mean, maybe maybe somebody who's you know racist and has race tendencies should be using the Socratic method because that's a very deep set underlying belief that they had in bias. But somebody who simply feels anger day to day or has a more, I would call it a more soft judgment. Maybe it doesn't need to use the Socratic method because I think the method is really employed best when you have some sort of deep bias that you want to systematically explore. But you're right; it's nothing. It's no. It's no tool that you need to use. So, day to day, because actually I think that may be negative. That may be negative to just abuse the tool, where perhaps it's not really useful, um, because that could also perhaps imply certain things about how you exhaust your, your mind and exhaust your, um, uh, exhaust your reflection that you, doesn't need to be exhausted. Um, Dan. Yeah. So responding to uh, someone made a comment about how stoicism might be uh, general or um, hard to apply to a specific situation. Uh, I, I often get asked, you know, 
is stoicism general in nature and you know how useful is it going to really be well i i would compare it to a lot of articles in the media today a lot of people are publishing articles about coping and resilience and they i read through some of them and they're really inadequate they they talk about coping and resilience but they don't tell you how to cope and resi and to be resilient and they often use buzzwords like you're empowered or you're a, you can do anything you know well these things are not really they're, they're maybe motivational or positive at the moment but they don't really help you get through things and then when people ask me in comparison to that what can stoicism offer and i say well we have specific tools you know like if you get upset or angry you can uh, you can take a pause. You can use reason. Uh, use your resources. Use your friends. Um, you can uh, think to yourself, I've been through worse than this. I can survive this one. Uh, and then uh, my favorite one actually comes from Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist, who says that when you feel anger coming on, imagine it in your mind like a little child who's approaching you. And uh, that just, you know, that is a psych it's probably a psychological as well as a buddhist idea but it certainly is a good stoic tool to look at your anger like a little child i'm going to take care of you now and you know let's move forward so that's these are very specific tools that i think really work sorry i, I just think that the, my own sort of um reading of the socratic method is exactly what shekham said it's it's like cracking a nut with a sledgehammer it seems like bringing in the um, heavy artillery. Um, I don't think I'm at that point yet, <laughs> thankfully. Um, so yeah, I'll use I'll use something a little um, a little less arduous. I think. Yeah, it is a really good point, um, and I really loved that. Uh, that is the first time I've ever heard an analogy like that. That's you know, Dan when you mentioned the little kid. I really love that. That's um, it's like the uh, the opposite of a, a sage, where you look up to the sage and you say, "This we should follow this person." But then, I didn't take it though as as actually. I like the way you put it, where you should take care of this child, um, because when you first mentioned um, you should treat this anger like a little child, um, I actually did something maybe anti-stoic. The first instinct I had was to look at that child, the proverbial angry child, and look at him antagonistically. Um which is actually the last thing you should do because already I was giving way to judgment about that child. Um, and, uh, but the, so in, a, in addition to the fact that you said, look at him and look at, look at it like an angry child. Then you also said, add on to that, to, to take care of it, to um, make sure it, it calms itself down because that's, that's also necessary. Um, that's a, that's a really good compliment to what you were saying before. Um, I really like that's a really unique one too. I've never heard that before. The, the way in which you un understood the we had two meetups on the passions the last two weeks never came about. So that was a really that's a really useful way of looking at a looking at anger. You said you got that from a Buddhist uh, Buddhist blog. Could we uh, could we learn about it? What what is the what is the Buddhist Buddhist blog? Yeah, I, I think um, if you Google um, lions roar. Lion's Roar is a major Buddhist online thing. If you Google that with the name Tick, not, well, his first name is Tick, T-H-I-C-H, Tick Not Han, you'll find, uh, oh, and then the last keyword is uh, anger. So it's uh, Lion's Roar, Tick, Anger. You should find his article on anger, which mentions this example of a little child, and I'm going to take care of you. Uh, that's where I first heard about it. But since then, since I first read that, I think the article may be three or four years old. Um, since then, I've heard other scholars, like uh, I, I think it was Massimo who said something like that in one of his lectures, to take care of it, um, you know, as it comes along. So I think that that Buddhist thinking is uh, flowing into Stoicism or modern Stoicism. It's a, it's a very uh, usable idea. It really is. Thank you. It also makes me think that I should be looking into more than just stoicism. I think we've had, um, we've had other meetups about other kind of intersecting philosophies like Buddhism and stoicism, but uh, it's always um, 
been past me so far in my journey in stoicism, uh, not past me in the sense of, uh, of beneath me, in the, in the sense of like, I, I'm still coming to that part of my journey where I'm still, still learning learn so much about stoicism. I think I've been um, either preoccupied or a bit uh, narrow-minded, yeah, narrow, narrow-minded, narrow-focused about it, where I'm, I'm so blind, I'm so, um, I have these blinders like the horses have uh, when they carry carriages, and I'm only looking at stoicism, but I'm not looking at uh, Buddhism or, or other philosophies, and uh, this kind of may be a good nudge to maybe start really looking at them. Um, and Gonzalo has been talking about it for weeks, but it's, it's really nothing that I've been taking, uh, um, taking seriously as a kind of effort of research to really go into the details about Buddhism. There is, by the way, a treasure of articles by Thich Nhat Hanh. I just put it into the uh, chat area. If you go to my website and click library and you scroll down, you'll see there's a link to the Lion's Roar collection of Thich Nhat Hanh articles. And they're free. I think uh, maybe eventually they may ask you to subscribe, but that's uh, an impressive collection of articles by Thich Nhat Hanh. And that would be a great way to start your adventure, as you said, if you want to look into other areas. Uh, his ideas as a Buddhist are compatible with Stoicism and very wise, very readable. Thank you. Um, Tony. Yeah, I was just interested to ask Dan, um, are there any aspects of Buddhism which are completely irreconcilable with Stoicism? You know, such as karma, rebirth, things of that nature. Or do you disregard some elements of those um, to, to sort of fit in with those? How does that work? Yeah, the, uh, in, in my exploration, I found that um, the attachment element of Buddhism is the most compatible with Stoicism because we talk about attachments and control and, you know, dichotomy of control. But the least uh, compatible part is where a Buddhist might meditate and look for no self or, uh, you know, quieting the mind, which you might think, well, that's a little like stoicism and tranquility, keeping your tranquility. But on the other hand, the, the Buddhist culture, when seeking no self, is to quiet the mind and have also no thinking, uh, you know, to have a, like a silence or a void. And that to me uh, that part of Buddhism doesn't appeal to me because I'm always thinking about, I mean, I'm, I try to be focused, you know, I don't have, I try to avoid the chaos of my thoughts, but I don't think I'll ever get to the no self part as a personal goal. I'd rather be thinking and be focused instead of the void. So that's just my opinion. That's, um, that's really interesting you say that. That makes a lot of sense. I think in um, in Stoicism, whether you use the Socratic method or you're simply through another method examining your beliefs and judgments, you're examining them. I think it sounds like, and I'm, I'm not a Buddhist, but what it sounds like is that the, in Buddhism, um, what you're doing is not ignoring your beliefs and judgments, but you are, you're, you're kind of, um, uh, kind of trying to meditate long enough or come to a pace, a, a state of tranquility where you don't even understand that they exist. You don't even treat the, treat them like they exist, like the self almost, um, which is entirely not stoic. It's in stoicism, you do treat that they exist and you start um, dissecting them and challenging them and understanding why you have those beliefs. But so, yeah, it's, it, it does sound very anti-stoic um, in that regard, at least that part of it does. Um, it's also, I'll quickly add that uh, my Buddhist group recently read chapter four of Robert Wright's book called Why Buddhism is True. And in that chapter four, the author questions this meditation thing. How often should we meditate? How long? What are we seeking? Are we seeking nirvana? Will we ever get there? And he says, honestly, many people don't get there but it is a calming factor in your life. So Robert Wright is also very skeptical about this meditative process. It's also interesting um, as we, um, 
as you talk about these various methods and various philosophies, what the term meditation means. Um, uh, Socrates would have meant it very systematically and logically. The Buddhist might have thought it meant simply leaving out other thoughts and ideas and thinking about nothing, kind of trying to connect more to your your body and the, and the rest of your mind and and um, leave out any other extraneous thoughts or, or judgments. And this, the other Stoic and CBT methods would consider meditation like Marcus Aurelius. They, they discuss and kind of um, flesh out their, their judgments and beliefs and why they think this and why they think that. Um, word meditation is kind of an obscurity almost if you just use it out of context. Just a passing observation I made but up between these. Um, but I would always I would always tend to prefer um, at least first and foremost the the Aurelius typical Stoic method. The um, because I, I can't like you said, I can't imagine not thinking. <laughs> I can't imagine just just leaving my mind empty like that. It's it's too noisy. And if um, if I com if I contrast a busy mind with that busy mind, if you're um, uh, everybody knows this 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 state of mind that where they're at one time in their life lying in bed and thinking of all the things they have to do the next day. I'd rather have my mind um, busy with really interesting and interrogative and and and, and reflective thoughts than nothing, as opposed to the stressing about the things to come. Um, yeah. Abdul. Did you raise your hand? Oh, okay. Uh, so um, we are uh, heading into the last 20 minutes. Um, this is a meetup on, on Socratic, on the Socratic method. Um, and, but we are, we're, I'm glad to talk about anything you want to talk about. Um, like I said, during the slideshow, I, I did want to end with a kind of a practice Socratic method. Um, if you guys are interested, um, this doesn't have to take too long. We can spend the next 15 to 20 minutes doing it and we can start, uh, doing it in the, mm, the Socratic method sense. We could start with a basic statement or bias we may all have. Um, I think making it as general as possible, but as um, uh, contextual as possible, perhaps about um, what good means or what a virtue means or something that's related to what we've been discussing in general, and then start examining what that sentence really means and why we may agree with it, and then have a little bit of a I think the dialogue and debate will come naturally. I think we already have, we already know each other and we already have this good good feel of how to how to discuss things. Um, if I may turn my sl slide over. Yeah, actually, while we're thinking about this, oh, you, you got your slides up. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say this is uh, this is a good time to ask a kind of an awkward question, is um, uh, but in a Socratic and constructive way, uh, I found it difficult to get into the meeting today because you have a Berlin Stoics website which you can register on, mm -hmm. and it sends you an email, but it had no link, and then the meetup itself had a link off to the right side, but you said that link is not right. And then the link finally appeared as a comment. So I had to look through three ways before I got into the meeting. Uh, I see. That, I think it just yeah. seemed difficult to me. I think what happened was traditionally, um, I, uh, uh, so I can't, I realized that I, for some reason, Meetup doesn't allow me to re make an event if it's online. Uh, I can't make an event that's online without putting a link in there. So what happens is if I don't create the link as soon as I do, as soon as I can, which I don't, because these these meet these meetups, I only create the link kind of just 20 minutes before. I the link from the last week is left there. 
So this week was different. I actually, for the first time, I kind of put a comment in the event description that said, by the way, guys, this, this first link is not the right link. And I think what happened was people didn't look at that until the end of the week. And then that confused everybody like you that, wait, wait, is this link correct or is this link correct? So um, uh, I think I should mind myself maybe next time I don't even mention that. I just, um, uh, because in the past it's worked normally as before. This is the first time I mentioned that the link didn't work. So uh, I'll write that down and I'll make sure never to, <laughs> never to mention that. But that's a technical thing. Meetup doesn't allow you to, I've tried this before. When I delete the old link and try to create the event, it just leaves the old link in there. So it doesn't make, it doesn't allow me to make a, an online event without registering some sort of link in it. So that was the that was the whole reason why I, I just I tried to um, preface it in the in the week before about the um, about the old link. Hmm. And you can't create the link a week in advance. Uh, I I can, but I so if I had an account with this, I, I can. But I'm afraid that I'm, af I'm afraid that if I create the link, and I don't think, <laughs> sure. I mean, realistically, I don't think anybody else is going to be thinking of the name Berlin Stoic Socratic Method as their meetup, uh, as their video conference name. <laughs> it's way too specific. Yeah. But um, I, I did kind of have a feeling that uh, if anybody could create any link, uh, that I kind of didn't want to create such a instantaneous link beforehand such so far so far before so i um but maybe it, it does come time to a point where I, I create an account with this uh with this service um so um yeah, yeah i'll take that into account though let it thanks for letting me know um uh i didn't have one prepared and I, I wanted to I wanted to ask you guys, is there something and I'll, I'll use this as an example, because this is not something that we necessarily need to use as the main example of dissecting and understanding um, why it may be false or, under, or kind of critically examining this judgment. Um, but uh, for example, um, there's the uh, bullet point. No, I don't have that anymore. Um, uh, Uh, it is good to always be um, wise, or we can say something like uh, it is um, uh, um, bad to always, uh, it is bad to be ignorant. Uh, it doesn't have to be either of these. I'm just giving you a general statement. It doesn't have to be about wisdom, but it could be any general bias or statement that you think you believe in, or you think, if not that, then you think that most people take for granted. And we can start critically examining that. Because I think this would be quite interesting to kind of start tackling. I think, Tony, you started doing it before anyway. I mean, you started questioning what Socrates really meant by what good and wise means. I think to him, you might have been, you might have been your own Socrates, because he probably wouldn't even think of what that meant to be good and wise. He kind of just equated the two very, very, very roughly. So I think you already started doing that, but I think if we start right off with a statement like this, um, uh, this could provide a, a good template for what really the Socratic method is. Um, but I'm not sure if anybody else has another idea for what bias or maybe starting statement we should use for this method. These are hard to think of. Yeah, I think I could provide you with a few examples. And I would, I would actually prefer if we did choose either one of these. This, I think, is quite interesting because the idea of ignorance, although we typically think is bad, um, well, I can't say any more because that would defeat the whole purpose of the Socratic method. But um, I have some ideas for how that road could go down well. There's also a, a topic that Gonzalo had mentioned a week or two ago about the word rational. For example, the Stoics always preferred that um, you stop, you wait, you think after you feel this passion, and you try to think rationally about it. And perhaps we also investigate what that means, is that um, uh, we should always think rationally rather then uh, impulsively, and we could examine this. Oh, 
we could examine this as well. Um, so there, I think there are some good stoic um, kind of statements or stoic statements that you would traditionally think are just tacitly true that I think would be interesting to examine, not because they're untrue, but because perhaps there's a lot more to think about in terms of the terminology. Uh, Abdul, do you have your hand raised this time? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is a question or a statement that we can discuss, but generally talking about um, biases, um, isn't it all right to have biases as long as we are aware of them and we are willing to change them if something opposing it tr and, and true at the same time and we are willing to change to this through through opposing idea. I because think, I'm think go ahead, sir. No, I something very quick. I think I actually think that's very it's very wise to do. Like it, to understand that you can never be rid of your biases. That you always have them, but always understand that they're open. Yeah, that's that's a very wise thing to do, I think. No, I mean but do you think philosophically <laughs> Is it wrong to be biased? Oh. Okay. Yeah, let's start there. I'm Shakam. So what do you mean by b bias? Because um, like the generalizations are useful. Um, it, it's like it helps you understand stuff a uh, uh, quicker uh, are biases just when it harms other people or when it's a uh, a uh, untrue or what 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 do, what do you mean exactly uh, yeah maybe it's hard to define bias in the first place but generally what i think about biases is to uh, um the ideas that we pursue and we believe that are true. Um, I mean, that's that's how I think about biases. I'm not sure if this is the correct definition of it, but uh, a definition that I could generate based on my understanding to biases is that ideas that we think are true and that we pursue, uh, especially when it comes to dealing with others, um, but then we start to realize we are being aware of these biases. For example, if I'm reading um, an article and then I find that, that the thought or scale that I'm going with is wrong, then I change this idea and change this approach to a different one or experiment with it and see that's more valid than the one I have. And that's why I shouldn't consider the current thought I have as first choice, or even eliminate it completely from my life. See my point? I'm not sure I'm trying to come to determination for the meaning, but that's my attempt. Yeah, Dan. Yeah, to follow Abdul, there's a psychology term that says that some of our biases are deep-seated. In other words, we've had them so many years or so many experiences are built upon them that it's much harder to overturn them like an old habit. Um, but nonetheless, this deep-seated bias could still be false. You could have a fear of public transportation because of you know some childhood experience, and then you never took a bus ever again in your life. But then you know when your car breaks down, you may need to try it and may need to see that Public transportation is fine, you know, so that's that's the psychology term, a deep-seated bias. Um, I also wanted to, that's a really good one. Like I, for example, have a, um, I have always had a deep-seated bias about bees or anything, anything flying with a, with a stinger. Uh, um, and um, I, for the life of me, have never been able to figure out why. Um, this is probably very early childhood. Um, 
But it's actually interesting that uh, Abdul, you you kind of defined bias as something that you um, you know is wrong and that you kind of pursue to kind of contradict because you you need to critically examine it. You know it's a bias and you know it's something you have to perhaps correct because it's I, and I reason I, I mentioned that it's interesting because most of the time we don't we don't even know what our biases are. I feel like like if we if you if you had let's say you could you could count the number of biases you had biased statements you would agree with at a hundred, um, I would guess that you actually don't even are not even conscious of most of them, um, because that's I don't know when I whenever I hear the word bias that's what I think of it's something that you don't initially recognize and something you have to recognize. Um, because that to me, whenever I'm hearing about, um, uh, interventions, um, uh, yeah, it, it, uh, any kind of example would do an inter intervention about some sort of addiction or as intervention is about some sort of habit. Um, people are not actually aware of it in the first place. Um, so it was just interesting that you also mentioned that it was, um, you know, bias is something that you initially recognize, but, um, uh, I, I think it's something that you're not even what we would never be able to. I would argue it's never something we're even we'll be able to ever purge completely. That um, maybe every, maybe a particular bias we come to recognize, we could come to a, 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 a very slowly but surely overturn and kind of establish a new belief or more healthy idea. But I think over the course of our lifetimes, I think we'll always have deep-seated biases to an extent, and some of them we'll never be able to find and purge. But um, that's a, oh yeah, Tony. Yeah, I was just gonna say, maybe these biases are just um, inherent in all of us. We don't really have a choice. Um, but I'm just thinking about socialization as well, what, what role that plays in the biases that we hold and whether those biases are actually socially acceptable in our um, general lives, in the context that we live in, whether that has an effect on whether we purge them or not. Um, but I think they're generally just deep-seated and it's only the free thinker really who would even bother to, to think about them, yeah, and try to do something about it, yeah. So that's a really good point, this socialization. Um, actually, I'll bring, I'll bring up a good, good example. I just watched an interview yesterday, um, which is about a year old, um, about a uh, center here in Berlin. And did you know that Berlin is the home of the only center in the world, as far as as far as the, um, uh, the interviewer knew, this was from Vice News. And they were interviewing a psych, um, I, either a psychologist or a um, psychotherapist or a psychiatrist and he worked at a center for pedophiles and in germany like unlike the us and other countries in germany it is Ill it is illegal if a pedophile goes to a therapist and says i have these thoughts or i have these sexual preferences to go to a law enforcement or authority figure um in the us it's actually legal if the uh, uh, psychologist thinks that they have never offended or abused a child, but if they, the psychologist feels like they still pose a threat to society, they could legally go to the authorities and tell them this person has these thoughts and the authorities could arrest them. It happens all the time, what I learned, it's actually astonishing. And um, that right there is a kind of a already bias that I had about pedophiles that, um, I'm not talking about their sexual preference, I'm talking about the fact that they offend it's, I, I, rarely, I, I rarely ever thought about the fact that there were probably a lot of people out there um, that, um, that had these preferences, but tried to actively never act on them because they knew it was wrong. Um, also, what I learned in the interview was that, interestingly, a lot of other people who are not pedophiles, who don't have these sexual preferences, abuse children. So kind of breaking down those biases, and this is a very strong one, and this is a very strong one we have, because we immediately hear the word pedophile and you think imprison them. You think you have to impose justice on them because this is, it, this shouldn't ever happen in society. And I think um, 
when we hear the word pedophile, we also think of um, uh, somebody who abused children, but we never think of the people who actively try not to, but yet still have those urges and they, they want to find help. Um, just uh, connecting the idea of a bias and socialization, Tony was talking about that um, we've been socialized and conditioned to think like this, but actually um, uh, this bias um, may be something we need to slowly break down, a little bit like drug addiction, and we need to slowly break down the, or alcohol addiction, and slowly break down the bias that they are inherently evil and that they simply may need therapy and any kind of stronger help because, um, that might be um, kind of the way out, the way in, in which we help them. I think by that argument, I'm thinking, so just to come around basic to the, to the, to the main question, um, it is difficult because this, this bias, for example, might have been very deep seated in me had I not really thought about it. Um, uh, but um, I'm still, I'm still, uh, mm, I'm not sure if every bias is necessarily even a bad thing. And never mind that we have biases in the, never, never mind that um, um, uh, all biases are bad. Uh, never mind that, sorry, um, having all biases or uh, having biases at all are bad, but that um, some biases may be good. And I'm trying to think of a good bias because Tony thought to mention socialization and perhaps um, there are some things we're conditioned to socially that may be acceptable that we may actually want to keep even after we examine them, even after we uncover them. Yeah, Abdul. Yeah, um, I, I just maybe um, a positive bias that um, is good to have is to um, be understanding towards others. For example, if um, if if someone got pissed off on you and uh, he didn't do anything wrong, like just burst up on you, and you can't just be understanding and say, okay, may, they may had a bad, have they may be having a bad day, or you know, have the um, tendency to be merciful and forgiving. Um, yeah. Or maybe trying to be helpful even with strangers. That's a bias. Like, I do have the tendency to help others instead of saying, oh, it's not my business. And I'd rather main maintain my own business and not helping others. Um, just thinking about social responsibility, I think that's the bias or the tendency to helping others as much as you can. I... I I would consider this as bias. I don't know if it's a bias or not, but I would consider this as bias because that's a thought that you follow. Um, yeah. <laughs> Again, that's what I think personally. I'm not sure if it's something. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if what I'm saying is correct or not. So is it a bias or not? But I mean, that's the way I see it. Hmm. Uh, I think I saw Dan's hand up first and then and Tony's. Thank you. Uh, yeah, following Abdul's comment, um, I think bias is an important part of our lives. For example, lately on Facebook, I don't get friend requests from from anyone that um, really ha could be a meaningful friend or an acquaintance. I think uh, all of them fall into categories like uh, it's a woman who wants to start chatting with me, and I know where that's going because it's probably a foreign account and a scam artist who just wants to create a relationship and then ask me for a few hundred dollars because I don't know her mother's in the hospital or whatever's going on um, or number two is uh, in America the uh, what do they call it the um, the um, payment protection uh, I'm sorry payroll protection program that the government is issuing uh, suddenly a lot of people are becoming consultants in that. And they, the, the conversation goes another way, and I can tell it's going right there right away. Hey, have you heard the good news? More payroll protection? And I just, I block them after that. Now, you know, you might think, well, Dan, that's mean. You know, you're not even giving them a chance, but I can see where it's going because I've been patient with them in the past, 
and I saw where this pattern is going, this one or two method, chat me up or payroll protection plan. And uh, I can tell where it's going with such accuracy that I just block them. I don't even try anymore. <laughs> so that's my bias. <laughs> uh, Tony. Yeah, I think it, it's relative as well, bias, because, for example, I mean, I have two sons, and if I was to favor one son over the other, it would be positive for one son and negative for the other. Um, so bias, really, uh, just thinking about it, I don't think is so cut and dry. Um, there's positive and negative aspects to, to probably every bias, depending on how they are implemented and used. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, Ashokan. Yeah, I just want to say that I think by definition bias uh, is where something is uh, unproportionally favored and sometimes to an unreasonable degree or wait, maybe always to an unreasonable uh, degree. And stuff like uh, valuing your uh, own community uh, above uh, others can lead to yeah lots of positive uh, effects but when a foreigner comes around um oh we lost the um then uh, this bias uh, hinders all the interactions uh, with this outsider so I think uh, you can call an idea a bias when, when it has a negative effect. Um, and one bias that uh, uh, I like is called the IKEA effect, is where people um, give more value to, um, to, to furniture they assembled themselves regardless of the actual value of the of the table or or whatever um, it can be negative when they uh, try to sell it uh, to um, you know to, to other people and uh, um, misjudge uh, the price because you know it's usually not very good uh, quality but I, I like it because it's something like very simple, very cheap, and uh, can give uh, can give you like a good feeling about uh, your furniture that you made them, them yourself. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think um, biased it's it's when an idea becomes bloated and maybe less useful. Hmm. I think that's I think that's also good. Like from our um, uh, as we've been discussing this, that um, um, there's a I think we maybe too much equate the diff like the, the the words idea or thought or worldview and bias. And when we say bias, I think that's a that's a good definition, at least a starting definition. That bias is something not just an idea, but maybe um, a, a disproportionately believed or agreed upon idea, some idea that's so believed it's unreasonable to a degree because it's uh, perhaps we're not giving it in context in context, or perhaps it's not, uh, it's not, we're not giving it relative to who you are and in, in which situation you are. Um, so, and, and yeah, by that measure, I think all biases would be bad, would be um, because they are disproportionately believed and they're, um, of course, perhaps that statement um, that uh, that one person kind of contact you on Facebook is a scammer is um, <laughs> is most of the time true, right? But obviously, um, in context, sometimes it's not always true. And I think um, I think that's a really good word when you said disproportionate, because a lot of the statements we 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 think of are as biased are um, are only conditionally true. Yeah, Tony. <laughs> um, I think we are getting past the hour now, um, but um, that's a really good definition to have. Um, Abdul. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say if um, if bias is meant to be thoughts that we usually follow and has negative outcomes, um, then yes, for sure, uh, they are things that should shouldn't be followed or pursued. But honestly, um, as humans, I mean, I think that we are emotional creatures and we tend to um, be biased. But to be aware of these biases and avoid complying to them blindlessly would be the key. Because I feel we cannot eliminate ourselves from the biases completely. Because we will be considered as robots, I believe. Um, because robots don't have feelings and when you eliminate your biases, it's like you eliminate yourself from feelings. Um, I, I feel that we cannot eliminate ourselves from biases, but we are aware of them. And because we know they exist, you know, the first part of the problem of solving a problem is to identify the problem because many people don't see the biases and they think, oh, it's common sense, it's nature. Um, is something natural, is something shouldn't be argued or discussed because that's part of us. <laughs> but not everything part of us is is reasonably should be followed. And rather, for example, imagine your brother came to you and said, okay, I had a fist fight and someone bet me. Uh, would you just have the tendency because your brother's been in a fist fight and has been beaten? Then you go and see the other person who, who, who did that to him. Or you realize that, oh, you did this mistake and you started it. And although you've been beaten, you should go and apologize because you started this fist fight in the first place. I mean, it takes like a big chunk of um, awareness to say, okay, it's true this is my brother, but he started this problem and he's supposed to end it. Or oh, if you see my point, I mean, th those are one of the emotional biases that people tend to follow. Um, I'm not sure if it's a good example, but I tried to catch what came to my mind and <laughs> that what, uh, what I came up with. But yeah, generally speaking is, for example, when people go and criticize your field of study. <laughs> you tend to jump in and say, oh, hold on a minute. <laughs> and you try to get defensive. Or when people criticize you, you, you tend to get, yeah, that's a good one. When people come and criticize you, um, you tend to be defensive and you think they are attacking you. But I think what's wise is to realize that you're a human and you're not perfect and to see whether this is true, whether what they're saying is true or not in the first place, and filter down what's been said. Because sometimes they may be bluffing, and if they're bluffing, why well, you should be upset and try to explain yourself. Um, because I had this before. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned that before, but yeah, I had an issue with a project manager. He's saying, oh, you keep breaking out the uh, guidelines of the team and that will affect your evaluation i say like okay i mean what kind of can you clarify what kind of guidelines i've broken i said you've uploaded the file before uh, my consent and you're not supposed to do that and i said you never mentioned that in the first place and if you mentioned it i would have done it i understand you're upset <laughs> But then at the same time, I wasn't aware of the rule. As a matter of fact, he sent me a message. He said, there's a file on the cloud. Feel free to drop anything related to it in there. And I highlighted the word anything. So you said anything and now you're upset. So I understand you, you are upset because I did something that you're not supposed to, uh, that you, against your uh, what what you want as team leader, but at the same time I wasn't aware of it. So the accusation of you 
saying that I broke guidelines. This guideline doesn't didn't exist before I, uh, I, I mean, before this conversation started. So, but other people may rage or say, "Oh, what kind of uh, like may start to fight or may may start an argument." But it's unwise to start an argument, um, although it was sounds like a threat, you know, or that may affect your evaluation. That's a threat. So you may be kind of egoic. I say, hey, who are you to threaten me in this way? You know, but you shouldn't be egoic and rather accept that. <laughs> okay, something is wrong happened and you should have a priority. What's what's more important? Is it to go further with this project and have a healthy relationship or you don't mind breaking up this bond and fire up the conversation and saying who are you to threaten me <laughs> you know it's at the end either of the choices can be true depending on the situation but i'd rather go with a peaceful solution because it's always good to end up relationship on good and uh, on good uh good good deed or you know peacefully instead of creating enemy and because honestly myself i don't want i don't enjoy being remembered badly whenever people mentioning them my name to them for example oh oh this person that that egoic guy that think that he doesn't do anything wrong you know i don't want to be remembered badly uh, as much as i can i mean <laughs> you cannot uh, control that but intentionally, I don't want to be intentionally remembered badly. Hmm. Yeah. No, thank you. There's a lot to unpack. And I think before I, I, say, I say a few things, um, I think Dan raised his hand. Yeah, just a quick thing. Um, I think one of the most popular biases is that people are afraid of their bosses. Uh, whatever they might do, you, you might say something wrong and you might get fired. That's ultimately a fear that results from bias. And so, yeah, we, we have to balance that in our life everywhere. It's actually, that's true. Uh, if I was, I mean, this project was part like voluntary, you know, um, it was um, a scientific project, but it was like academic. Uh, surely if I was paid for this role, I will not have this, I will handle this conversation quite differently, just to be honest. Because, you know, if you're paid, you're mm -hmm. right. Um, I may not be as direct um, as that. Yeah, I, I will be more diplomatic, I would say, um, if I was paid. You're right. You're right. I think there's oh, a... I'm um, honest, yeah. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> um, there's a... Uh, I, 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 I wanted to say this, but actually, I, I just realized this is something that philosophers always do, that they, um, in, in Christianity, in, Christians always like to say, what would Jesus do? Um, and, and there's a joke in philosophy that philosophers say, what would Socrates do? Mm -hmm. um, and um, I, I find it interesting because um, the, the, the way in which um, I, I would recommend, and this is only because I take this from um, uh, what Socrates had did when coming up to his, uh, his fellow dialoguers, um, I actually think Stoics would have been very good at that, would have been welcoming to that idea. I think if Socrates ever came up to them, because they lived a few hundred, hundreds of years apart, be, um, uh, I don't think a full 500, I, I, I forget um, when Zeno um, found uh, the work of so uh, the work uh, Socrates was put in. But um, uh, so Socrates didn't meet the Stoics, but if he had done that, I think he would have been he would have found the stoics a lot more welcoming to his method than other people because i think the stoics would have been a lot more um anchored and willing to accept that they're ignorant and uh i think you're right i think that um i think when i when i was asking what would socrates do i think what i'm trying to ask you is um uh what would you do in a situation um like for example if you were paid and you're you have a dispute with your boss um what would you do generally? What would be the ideal thing to do? I think if you really want to escape the this kind of du kind of missed duality between um, having no problem disagreeing with somebody 
who is running a project over you and you're volunteering with no pay versus um, some, somebody you disagree with who's, you know, who could fire you and threaten your livelihood. Um, I think you have to ask yourself, what would you do in any situation? And that doesn't mean to take just one or the other and then apply them to both situations. I think you need to start thinking about like, how would you respond to anybody you disagree with and do it so stoically and rationally and kind of um, measuredly, temperedly. So you don't come across as antagonistic or that you mean wrong. Um, I think you need to do that. I think, I think, uh, at least I would do that for myself. That's why I'm just thinking about that recommendation that um, I'm not a psychotherapist, but this is just something that I would like to do for myself is I always do that. I always think what is ethical and what is um, uh, the right way to hold, to compose myself and the right way I should treat that other person. And I think everything else will kind of naturally follow. You froze for a moment there. Well, I was going to respond to what he just said. Uh, in my life, I have something called the director concept. I have a friend. Uh, he's a Cuban filmmaker. And sometimes over the years, he's made films. And I've been his assistant director when he's the director. And I, I remind him because he's so understanding and he wants to get everyone's opinion. But I always remind him at the beginning of a film project, you're the director. I'm going to give you some suggestions, but it's your decision because you're the director of this independent film. And I remind him that because he always takes my suggestions so seriously. Like, uh, you know, he's, I can see him struggling. Should he, should I take Dan's opinion or should I do it my way? I tell him always, you're the director. <laughs> I remind him that. And I say, if it were reversed, if I were the director of a film, I would expect your respect that you can give me suggestions, but you don't feel hurt. If I say, no, I'm going to do it my way. That's a good idea, but I'm going to do it my way. And I think that people would just using that one concept, if people understand where they are in a, in a department or in a company, then they would realize better, uh, Hey, I can give a suggestion and I won't feel bad if they turn me down, you know, that's okay. I wonder what happened to him. Maybe his internet failed. Uh, yeah, we're just uh, three. You don't have to uh, raise your hand. Mm. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, I just want, yeah, I, I do agree with you, Dan. Um, it's also, I think, it has to do with uh, treating people as you wish to be treated. Uh, because, yeah, many times you think, um, and that's really the main thought that comes to my mind, like um, before responding or reacting or acting upon anything, um, w uh, like saying, uh, would I be uh, like, would I like to be treated this way if I was in this person's p position? Um, and I would make my uh, response mainly based on that. Well, of also other elements, but I mean, mainly based on that. Um, but yeah. Interesting. I really like the idea about the uh, um, the anger and the, the child. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. Um, it not only sticks with me as a memorable uh, metaphor, but um, it's because I repeat it often. It's probably the most often quoted Buddhist idea that I I, I talk about with my friends. And be so yeah. So that story really resonates with me. And I'm glad you like it. It's um, yeah. It's a great crossover idea. This is again why I like comparing Stoicism with Buddhism and other belief systems. There's often the other system may have a different way of expressing it, which and it'll it'll appeal to me or some other people. But that's yeah, why we're here. We're here to learn something. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Like um, like yeah, even. You, you imagine when someone gets upset when you try to calm them down. It's like exactly the same <laughs> sequence when you try to calm down a child. <laughs> you try to calm down, down an adult. I mean, most of the time, by uh, saying "relax" or "it's okay, don't worry." Oh, he. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. Um, I think that I think that rings the bell. Um, 
my Wi-Fi is down. I have to. I'm using my data right now, so um, uh, perhaps I um I start closing out. Um, thank you guys for continuing. Um, it's glad to see you're all still here. Um, uh, thank you guys for coming and participating. Um, I'm sorry if I cut anybody short, but maybe this is the time to kind of close out the the meetup. Um, uh, I hope this was useful. Um, I I pushed this up. And I, I don't think I was prepared as I really could have been, although I did prepare some slideshow, some material, and some format to use. Um, I pushed this up because uh, Ava is going to take a little bit more time to prepare for her woman in Stoicism meetup, um, which is originally this week. But she, this is her first time organizing a meetup for us. So this, this is going to take some time. So tentatively, it is next week. But um, I'm going to have a backup for next week, um, just in case she needs to push it back further. Um, I am thinking of uh, doing something, but I wanted to feel the uh, group and see if uh, anybody has a recommendation for doing something next week. Hmm. Maybe relationships and uh, stoicism. Um, I was doing a little bit more research, and there is uh, there is a nice article that got me thinking we might could we could do something separate about that. Um, there is an article on the um, uh, excuse me I can't find it. It's a Canadian um, online magazine. Um, it's a little bit like the Canadian. It's like the Canadian version of the New Yorker, and uh, called the Montreal Review. And this philosopher had posted a nice article on there. Uh, about the difference between how um, Epicureans and Stoics view friendship and love. And I think that got me thinking this would be maybe a, a good uh, an interesting place to start. And we have a kind of a deep dive into the passion of, of love and friendship. Um, yeah, we could do that. Uh, Dan. Another suggestion is um, I have a new presentation for Stoic discipline the ways of thinking about discipline within the Stoic framework. And I just presented that at the University of Toronto a couple of weeks back. So it's got a PowerPoint and everything. And if you'd like to hear that, uh, that could be a future meeting. We could, uh, that would be lovely actually to have a, a guest um, a guest speaker do a presentation. Yeah. Um, uh, so I don't know what everybody's thinking. Um, would you rather have something more focused on specifically friendship and love or have Dan present next week? And we can do both. We can just have them in, in different orders. It's up to, up to you. Abdul, I guess maybe you want to ask answer because you may have a preference for one or the other. I'm not sure. Yeah, I, th I think it's great. Yeah. Um, discipline. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's, it's also a flexible idea. If uh, Ava wants to present or is ready to present, I could put it off another week uh, because my presentation's already done in PowerPoint. So it's it can be whenever you like it. That would be fantastic. Um, yeah. So let me um, let me tentatively schedule for you for next week, um, and uh, I'll ask Ava if she's ready or wants to postpone it. Um, I just have one question. Um, so how long is your presentation? Thirty minutes. Okay. So we could have uh, a 30 minute presentation by you. I can give you a short introduction and then maybe uh, a 30 minute segment afterwards of questions from the, from the community. Okay, perfect. Okay, so I'll put that, uh, does, um, uh, I'm just thinking of daylight savings now. Next week, uh, next Saturday is the 27th. And I forget, does anybody else, Shakam, do you know if we, if we turn the clocks? I think again? it happens on the 28th in the early morning. Yeah, it's that night. So, okay. Yeah, we'll have to watch the time. But also, if you could send me your email address, I will send you the event. I'm sorry, the presentation description. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, and I'll post that right in there. I'll post it in the event. That would be great. Um, uh, I, have your, I have your email, so I'll just email you. Um, and does this time work? So 4 o'clock for us would be um, 11 o'clock for you. Yep. So, okay. Okay, perfect. Um, I'll let everybody know. And uh, thank you for suggesting that. It's going to be great to hear what you have to say and great to hear your presentation. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, remember to join the Telegram group if you haven't already. Um, uh, remember to stay in contact. And um, I'll provide the details for the next few weeks um, as shortly as possible. So uh, I'll, see, I'll see everybody next week. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.
Thank you. See you. Bye.